Okay, so um, I introduced myself earlier as Marty Noe, President of Appliance Connection and a serving Board of County Supervisors. But if you read the email that invited you here today, I'm also the Chairman of the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, which is a role that I've had for actually, and this is kind of weird part, for nine and a half years, um, which is very unusual because if you know how sort of the many regional bodies we have here in Northern Virginia work, normally you're Chairman for a year or two, then you convince someone else to take the job away from you. <laughs> I was not able to convince anyone to take this job from me. Um, but it lets me come and talk to uh, groups like the Chamber and talk about some really cool things we've got going on here in Northern Virginia. So just share a couple different things. Let me give a little bit of context. So um, I, uh, like I said, as a member of the board, um, I am uh, the chairman's appointee to the NVTA. Um, and have, like I said, I've been serving in that role actually since Chairman Knott was in office. And the NVTA is a regional body made up of the five cities, four counties of Northern Virginia, plus um, about six or seven other government officials um, from the state, appoint, either appointed by the General Assembly or appointed uh, by the governor's office to, um, to deal with transportation issues in Northern Virginia, and specifically to deal with that transportation funding, which is exclusively dedicated to Northern Virginia. So to the extent that there are funds available for transportation that must be used for mobility and can only be used in Northern Virginia, the organization that I chair is the body that oversees those funds. The vast majority of the funds that fall into that category are what we call HB 2313 70% funds. The last time you hear me use that phrase today, what that means is that there, are, uh, there is a regional sales tax which generates about $225 million a year for Northern Virginia. 100% of the money is collected in Northern Virginia. 100% of the money must be spent in Northern Virginia. The decisions about how to spend it must be made by Northern Virginians. And the money must be used to improve transportation in our region. And perhaps uh, most critically, this is kind of the phrase that all of us in regional transportation have tattooed on our shoulder, is we fund projects that relieve the most congestion relative to cost. That's really important to understand because um, up until about five years ago, bluntly, large, important transportation projects got funded based on political patronage. Um, the Commonwealth, State Commonwealth Transportation Board officially made the decisions about what get funded, but they would begin by saying, first and foremost, what did the General Assembly put in the budget that we must fund? And that would take all the big projects off the top. During that period of time, there was no regional money. There was a body to allocate regional money if it existed, but we at the NVTA were basically just a planning organization at that point. Um, now, I'll say that it seems very unreasonable and very unfair that for so many years, powerful members of the General Assembly could get big, expensive projects funded in their particular districts and that they would rise to the top of the list above any other priority in the rest of the state. And it is deeply unfair, but we in, here in Princeton County never complained about it because during that time, much of that time, Senator Colgan was the chair of the Senate Finance Committee. <laughs> And he got lots of great projects for us. Like, for example, the widening and extension of Route 234 was a project that was absolutely critical to our area, but was funded largely because Senator Colgan was able to sort of do the right things in the, in the state Senate to make that project possible. Then the state came along and announced that uh, the General Assembly passed a law that said that both at the state level and at the regional level, projects had to be scored and evaluated based on empirical evidence, based on data, to say which projects give us the best overall return on investment. And I was crestfallen by that. And then Senator Colgan retired. And I said, no, no, actually, it works to our advantage again. Because <laughs> Prince William County has the biggest transportation gridlock problems in the region and in the state. So our projects tend to score very, very well. So um, since 2013, the NVTA has been allocate, has been uh, operating under this, uh, this funding regimen. It generates about $225 million a year. It used to be a little higher. We can talk later about why it went down if you want to. Uh, but it's not really related to what we're talking to you today. And we've been funding projects on a year-to-year -year basis. Every year we would finance a few hundred million dollars worth of projects. It was, the, it was the only tool we had. It was the right way to fund projects because we were sort of a newish organization, or at least knew what we were doing. Um, but we, um, it made it very difficult for it to take a long-term vision. Really big, really expensive projects just couldn't get funded when you're only looking at one year worth of funding. So starting this year, the NVTA has now adopted a six-year program. This is what the state does. This is what large localities do with their capital programs, where you look at least six years in the future to determine how much money you expect to have over that six-year window and how you're going to allocate it. What that allows you to do is spread funding out over several years and say that you may have a $300 million project that needs to be funded, but you don't need all $300 million this year. This year, all you need is a couple million dollars for design. In two years after that, we're going to need a 
$20 million, $50 million, whatever the number is, for right-of-way acquisition and utility relocation. And you don't need that construction money until the fifth or sixth year, or maybe even beyond. And by being able to plan that out over a long period of time, we can do a better job of planning our projects. Perhaps more importantly, we can fund more projects. We can actually uh, bring a lot more positive outcome to Bayer. Um, so this is where it gets very specific to this room. Um, very bluntly, um, Prince William County had a really good year this year in terms of transportation. And we're talking about some of the projects that we got funded this year. And all of these projects are projects that got funded, well, I should say, most of these projects are projects that got funded because they scored really well for congestion relief relative to cost. And then some of them also got funded because um, the chairman of the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority happens to serve on the Prince William Board of Supervisors, <laughs> and I was able to be very persuasive about having a project that didn't score quite as well, but explain about the important urgency of it for our region. I'll kind of go through those. Um, so this is a list. This is a list of all the projects we requested. You can't read this, and you don't have to. If you need it, we can email it to you. But what you, if you, if you, even without seeing the numbers, what you can see is we made requests for I want to say 10, uh, 10 projects. Uh, in our region. We got funding for most of them. Um, we have, uh, um, what we did not get funding for is constructing University Boulevard between Progress, Court, and Devlin Road. We didn't really expect to get that funded. Um, Devlin Road widening between Wellington Road and Linton Hall Road. Another one we didn't really expect to get funded. And constructing interchange around 234 and Sully Manor Drive, which we did expect to get funding for, but as it turns out, it didn't score very well. So we're going to go back and redesign the project. But more importantly, let's talk about what did get funded. So the first project that got funded is, hits home because most of you drove on this project today. Uh, Prince William County is in the process right now of doing the third phase. It's actually really the fourth phase. We call it the third phase of widening 28 right out here. Um, Route 28 between, um, between, uh, Noakesville, uh, between Fitzwater Drive and Pennsylvania Avenue. So essentially that's from Noakesville all the way up to roughly this building. By the way, there's a parallel project taking place in the city of Manassas that continues the widening out to Godwin Drive. Um, the phase that we got funding for, we got to $15 million that allows us to uh, do the last little bit of widening the four-lane section that already exists between Linton Hall Road and Pennsylvania Avenue to six lanes. Uh, if you've lived here long enough, you'll recall that it wasn't terribly long ago that Route 28 west of the city was a two-lane road all the way to Fauquier County. Um, the Commonwealth Transportation Board, thanks to Senator Colgan, got the road widened between... Um, between Linton Hall Road and Pennsylvania Avenue to four lanes. Since then, we've begun a project to widen it to four lanes all the way out to Noakesville, to realign Vint Hill Road, actually, yeah, to realign Vint Hill Road, create a new entrance there that's a little further west. And what that's done is induce more traffic, and now we need six lanes along this section of Route 28. Uh, we've been working on that project for a while, but we came up $15 million short, so the NVTA funded that last $15 million. That'll get that important project funded. It's pretty important from an economic development perspective, both for Prince William County and for the city of Manassas, because of the activity that you see around us here. Um, we need to break up this gridlock to get people home to work faster during the peak hours, but get that commercial and office activity that's taking place in the middle of the day, a lot more mobility. Um, it's a, so to support both activities that are taking place in the county, and especially over in the city off of um, Patrick County. What's the project over from Godwin? Gateway Boulevard. Gateway Boulevard. Um, so, the next project is kind of a small one in scope, but we'll get to the third slide in a minute. We got um, an additional $3.5 million to complete the study on for the National Environmental Policy Act for the Route 28 corridor. Anyone here ever drive on Route 28 north of Manassas? <laughs> 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 you, you know why you, no one's raising their hand? Because you don't. Because, the because no one drives on Route 28 anymore because it's so damn crowded. That was funny. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, this is a tough crowd. Thank you, man. Okay, so um, a few years ago, the MBTA funded about uh, uh, about, uh, about one and a half million dollars to do an environmental study to figure out what our best options were for adding more capacity to Route 28 north of Manassas. This area is the single greatest source of congestion in all of Northern Virginia, the most congested corridor in all of Northern Virginia. Now, there's a reason it's the most congested in all of Northern Virginia, and that's because Prince William County and now Fairfax County have done so much to make improvements to Route 1 mm -hmm. that Route 1 got better, and now Route 28 hasn't had time to catch up. Um, 28 has gotten worse, but while it's been getting worse, Route 1 has been getting better. They have always been the two biggest, they have been for many years, the two biggest problems in Northern Virginia. So we've got, we now have an additional three and a half million dollars to complete that environmental study. And, um, and what that's allowing us to do is determine what's the best way to relieve congestion in that corridor. Do we widen the road or do we build a bypass? And it's starting to look pretty much all of the evidence we have. Ah, 
that was not what it was. There we go. Um, is, there, is, there, is there a pointer thing on this? Okay, there's not a pointer thing on this. So, <laughs> this is being Route 28. What we're looking to do is take Godwin Drive, for those of you who know. This is the road that is the boundary between Prince William County and Manassas, near uh, Prince William Novant. Um, Prince William Novant UVA Medical Center, help me out with the name. <laughs> so I'm going to call the name now. Runs up between these neighborhoods here along that, if, you, if you're at City of the End of Godwin Drive, you can see that we can extend the road. And then we'll cut back down either and come through Yorkshire or cross over at uh, Old Centerville Road into Fairfax County and reconnect to 28. Um, but we've got to get a lot of environmental permits in order to make that possible. So that study is going to fund the rest of that. Now, the much more important part, from my perspective, than getting the study done, is actually building the road. So um, this year, and this is one of these moments where I felt like I was robbing the bank, um, the NVTA approved $89 million to construct one of these alternatives. Whichever alternative the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says we're allowed to build, I think it will be what's called Alternative 2B. Um, it's, we think, the most cost-effective solution. That's the road that follows, old set, follows God, takes Godwin Drive, extends it to Old Centerville Road, and takes it into Fairfax County. Um, that project, um, it's going to cost a little over $200 million. But what we were told at the beginning of this process was that we should expect to get about $20 million in this six-year plan, and that we could come back in future years. That was enough money to do the design on the road. That we could come back in future years and ask for additional money for, um, for right-of-way, for utilities, and for, um, and for obviously for construction. And instead, kind of at the last minute, the NVTA decided to fund this project to the tune of $89 million, which should be enough to get us all the way through the right-of-way phase. So once this study is done, actually, in fact, while the study is being completed, we can actually begin work on getting the design for this project done and then go to construction very shortly thereafter. It's still a very long-term project. I get asked every day, when is the county going to widen Route 28? The answer is now. Widening that two-mile section of Route 28 between Liberia Avenue and the Fairfax County line, it's a 2.2-mile section of road, widening it to six lanes would cost $270 million and would only add one additional lane of traffic in each direction. This project costs a mere $210 million um, and, um, and adds two lanes of traffic in each direction. It also does a lot to take traffic off of that Route 28 side west of the city of Manassas, it takes it around Manassas or up to 66, so that we dramatically reduces the amount of traffic that travels through historic Old Town Manassas, where there's really no opportunity to do any sort of additional capacity whatsoever. This is going to be a really big deal for our county, but it's going to take a little bit of patience. We can reasonably expect the project to be done done in 2025. And there's a pretty decent chance I won't be here for the ground, the ribbon cutting at that point, because I have to win at least two more elections at that point. And if you've watched the election results in the last few years, it's not looking good. Um, so um, some other projects. Another big thing, again, it affects this area directly is we have a challenge on Route 234 in that we have seven traffic signals between um, Lake Jackson Dam and I-66. We've got a couple of projects that are going to eliminate some of those signals. Um, the first is to uh, build a, um, a what they call it, innovative interchange. And if you look at this picture, it is really very innovative. But an innovative interchange at the intersection of Route 234 and Business 234, as well as that section of the Prince William Parkway that no one knows what to call, because it's called the Prince William Parkway. But a lot of people call it Liberia Avenue. Some people call it Brentsville Road. Well, what's going to happen is it's actually going to very solidly become the Prince William Parkway because you'll have free-flowing traffic from that east to west section onto the north and south section that runs right out here. And part of that project will include connecting old business 234 that goes up by the fairgrounds into Brentsville Road so that that traffic which needs to go across or make left turns will actually go over the road and then come back and make a right-hand turn. So we'll eliminate a lot of the movements and create much more free-flowing traffic through this heavily congested intersection. This was fully funded to $55 million. Um, so uh, this is something where we're gonna begin design this year. We're gonna begin designing this project right away. And we own most of the right away. So we'll go to construction in probably about two years. Um, another major interchange is at the intersection of University Boulevard around 234, another innovative intersection. Well, the goal of all of these is, is to increase throughput reduce stops, reduce left turns, without necessarily having to build elevated roads. So some of this means bypass roads, some of it means um, tying multiple intersections into one another. But this would create a, um, an extension of Discovery Boulevard that would connect into 234, and would it completely eliminate the traffic signals in this area, but would allow the signals to operate as a through, um, as let people go through on 234 for much longer periods of time by eliminating most of the need to make left turns at any of these intersections. Um, by sending people sort of 
down and around to make a right turn rather than making a left turn. Uh, that project is fully funded at $25 million. And another project, they'll probably see some construction on it in a pretty short period of time. Um, can we skip Clover Hill? No, okay, we'll come back to Clover Hill. No, we'll do Clover Hill now. So the other intersection is actually also right out here. If you came in the back way to this office, you turn left on Clover Hill Road, or turn left or right on Clover Hill Road, and come up Harry Parish Boulevard. This is the stops, this is the traffic signal that's least likely to create congestion in the corridor, which also makes it the least expensive to fix. About a $13 million project. It was actually originally recommended for full funding. Um, I actually requested that we only get money for the design. We're going to get $1.9 million to design this. And the reason I did that is I don't like this project. I like eliminating, or I like fixing the congestion of the signal. The way this project works is they put a, and, uh, and uh, um, Susan will be super, or Susan, Susan will be super familiar with this. What it does is put is a traffic circle on Clover Hill Road just before Perry Parish Boulevard, and another traffic circle just inside Godwin Drive, so that when individuals want to take a left here, what they would actually do is take a right, go up to the traffic circle, come de make a complete 180 at the traffic circle, and then go straight through the intersection. This will speed up traffic on Route 234 um, because it eliminates the need for a left turn signal at all. It will be impossible to turn left here. Um, folks here, folks at the airport are a little concerned about making it impossible to turn left into the airport. I'm not worried about that one. Um, what I am a little worried about is making it difficult for people to turn left to get to the VRE station that we're expanding. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I'm also concerned about these folks here, mostly in the city of Manassas, actually, who suddenly aren't going to make a left turn out of their neighborhood on the 234. So we're going to have to take a little bit of a look at this. But it's a really important project, and we're going to start the design. The design will begin in 2023. We've got a lot of time to figure out how we want to address this project before we actually start doing anything that resembles construction on it. Oh, and we go back to Summit School Road. So the $9 million, the $11 million that I took off of Clover Hill Road, this is where Good Persuasion came in, it's being used to fund the widening of Telegraph Road. This is on the east end of the county. And if you're familiar with Telegraph Road, it goes by the largest commuter lot in Virginia, maybe the largest commuter lot in the world, we think maybe. <laughs> you laugh. No, that one wasn't funny. It really is maybe the largest commuter lot in the world. Um, and, it's gonna be, and it's probably going to keep getting bigger over time. And the challenge we have is that we keep adding more service, more bus service, more carpooling services to this commuter lot. Um, Telegraph Road is not really, it's country road, and it's very difficult to get cars in and out of there. We finally are getting a traffic signal installed at the entrance of the lot, but we need more capacity to get people up to Medieval Road for this. Um, but this one didn't score as well, but because of some additional bus service that's being funded as part of the I-395 inside the Beltway toll project, um, we're going to need this road fixed a lot faster. So based on an urgency basis, we're going to get this design. But it's also really important from an economic development perspective. I didn't use economic development as an argument to get the project funded, but if you're familiar with this whole big area in here, this being, uh, this being Minneville Road, this being Cain Hill Road, it's a large undeveloped piece of land, several pieces of land here, called the Parkway Employment Center. It's, it's an area that's set aside for mixed-use community with residential, uh, office, commercial uses that no one seems especially interested in. Very difficult time marketing this piece of land, and it's largely because it's difficult to get in and out of here when your one of your main access points is going to be onto a country road like Telegraph. So this is going to be a really big game changer. Um, we're going to de start design on this right away. Uh, right away, if design goes well, we'll be back in two years asking for more money from the NVTA or from the state for construction. The last project that comes out of this that I didn't have a slide for because it wasn't a project that Prince William County requested, but it's really important to the county is we also have $44.8 million that's been allocated for the final design and right of way of widening Route 1 through the town of Dumfries. If you live in Dumfries or work in Dumfries or if you just drive through there occasionally, we have a really serious problem there where Prince William County has widened Route 1 between Quantico and the southern end of Dumfries, and we've made major improvements to Route 1 north of the town of Dumfries. But in Dumfries, what you have is you have their historic old town sort of sits between the northbound and southbound lanes of Route 1. Um, so adding additional capacity to that road is difficult without doing irreparable harm to some of the historic buildings in there. But meanwhile, we have a very serious congestion problem because there are you know, thousands of homes either in the town of Dumfries or just outside of it in Prince William County that are to the east of Route 1 and are sandwiched between Route 1 and the Potomac River. Those people literally have nowhere to go other than to Route 1. If they want to go to church, to school, go visit a friend, um, go to work, any place they need to go, those folks have to get on Route 1. There is no other option to get to some different road. So um, this is a project that the town of Dumfries has been working on for 20 years probably. 
Uh, and they've been able to get dribs and drabs, a million dollars here, a million dollars there to do preliminary design, to do studies. Having $45 million for that project um, is going to move it forward pretty dramatically. Uh, the Virginia Department of Transportation is, ma is managing that project at this point. Um, someday when it gets to the construction phase, it may be something that Prince William County takes over. I've, I think Rick Canizales, our transportation director, has made it clear that with these other projects, he's got a lot on his plate right now and doesn't really need another big project like this. But $45 million for the town of Dumfries is a really big deal. Um, and uh, it just so happens that the approval of that funds coincided with their town election. So their brand new mayor, Derek Wood, um, got, gets to brag, his very first meeting as mayor, he gets to come and announce, he gets to invite me and we get to talk about the $45 million. So that would be for sort of a fun night. A couple other things that aren't part of this program but I think also important to know about. Um, and I think someone from EMP is here, right? Oh, there we go. Um, so um, the 66 Express Lanes project includes $500 million for other transportation improvements in the corridor, other transportation improvements along 66. Uh, Prince William County also got the lion's share of that money. We got, I want to say it's $160 million to widen Ballsford Road between Sudley Road in the east and Devlin Road, you know, sort of crosses over 234, crosses over to Devlin Road. Adding additional capacity there will be huge for our economic development in that area. Um, then in addition to that, we got another 65 or so million dollars to build a grade separated interchange at Ballsford Road and Route 234. It'll be the diverging diamond configuration. So if you're familiar with the new interchange built at uh, I-66 and Route 15, and this is the one that people get confused by at first because you actually go into the left lane in order to get on the highway. We're building a diverging diamond there with those funds. And then um, they're also included in that is about $80 million to very dramatically expand capacity at the broad run uh, VRE station, just, just kind of across the street here, um, which will include a new parking facility on the north side of the tracks so that it's much easier to get in and out and you'll be able to get to VRE station via residency road rather than coming down Piper Lane or going through the airport. In addition to which, all of our trains at that point will be extended to either eight or 10 cars from their current six or eight car configuration. So we'll be adding about 25% capacity to the Manassas line. That will also include some additional track between here and the city of Manassas and a new parking facility in the city of Manassas Park. Between all of this, this equals about a half a billion dollars of new transportation investment that's been approved for Prince William County, cities of Manassas, Manassas Park, in the last 18 months, actually the last 14 months. Um, this will take our total transportation capital budget over the next six years to something on the order of $900 million. Um, we are about to become, I think, the second largest uh, transportation agency uh, in the Commonwealth behind VDOT. Uh, we'll be bigger than, we've probably been bigger than anyone else before, but we'll be a lot bigger than anyone else um, at this point. And uh, the part that Rick Canizales, who could be here today, and I like to brag about is, we believe that between the money we got from Express Mobility Partners, and thank you, and the money we got from the NVTA, and some additional money we got for a parking garage in Woodbridge from, um, from the Commonwealth Transportation Board, um, you see, you know, transportation funds sort of come every other year. You don't fund things like every other year you update your plan. Um, that Prince William County will have received more outside money for transportation than any jurisdiction in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia over the last two years. Um, and we believe it's going to be really transformative to everything we're doing. Um, yes, in terms of getting people to work and getting people home at night, but really more importantly, about getting people around the county. If you'll notice what a lot of these projects have in common is that, yes, projects like Route 28, the commuter garage in, in, in Woodbridge, are absolutely about getting people to the Pentagon or to Crystal City or to the new Apple headquarters if it lands here or wherever that ends up being. But it's also about making improvements to people who do live and work in Prince William County and getting people around this community. Because if we want to grow our economy in Prince William County, we need to be able to attract employers with the promise that our transportation problems are going to get better, not worse, by the time they bring their employees. So I have talked a lot, and I've talked really fast. Um, but I, I know in groups like this, there's going to be a lot of questions about transportation. So if you all have questions about these projects, or really anything about transportation, or really anything about Prince William County, because you don't like talking, um, <laughs> then you've got my full attention. So. Yeah. I have a question about your feasibility studies. Um, I've worked around lots of counties and gone through a lot of road construction uh -huh. in the last 15 years. And I see a number of businesses that I currently work with that have been impacted, I mean, definitely really traffic yeah, issues, sure. but now they're a destination versus a business that people would drive by. Mm -hmm. So do your feasibility studies include looking at existing businesses and the impact that it'll have 
by changing traffic patterns around? Sure. So it's a great question. So um, Prince William County, I'm going to answer it in a little bit of an indirect way, but it's important to have this context. So Prince William County has a list of, I would say, 15 priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a rough number, 15 sort of high priority projects. Then we've got an almost bottomless pit of lower priority projects that are important to someone. Um, everything up here was, some, was at some point a high priority project. Every project that we identify as a high priority uh, is on the list for a reason. Not all of them are on the list for the same reasons. Some are entirely about congestion relief. Route 28 would be a good example. Um, the projects along Route 234, these interchanges, are both about congestion relief but also about economic development. Um, so they might believe a little less congestion in 28, but they probably have a bigger impact on, on uh, congestion. There are some projects that are almost entirely about economic development. Improvements that we might make that didn't get funded, by the way, and we'll come back to this. Projects like the completion of University Boulevard, that's almost entirely an economic development project. There's congestion in that area, but we don't anticipate that road will be about con relieving that congestion. What it might be, what it might actually do is induce more congestion because it'll bring jobs, it'll bring people, but maybe that's the right trade-off to make. So, if a project is on our list because it's a congestion relief project, there's probably not a, analysis, not a lot of analysis at the front end, we're talking about feasibility, about how will this impact the adjacent property owners. Okay? So I'll use, Route 1 as, I'll use Route 28 as an example. We've had Route 28 as a priority for 10 plus years, but most of that time we were talking about widening the road. It wasn't until we got into the early design phase that we realized that widening Route 28 through Yorkshire affects a minimum of 70 businesses, most of which would be total takings, people that would be completely put out of business. And A, that's crazy expensive for the county because you not only have to buy the land when you condemn it, you also have to basically buy the business. Mm -hmm. You have to pay fair market value for the business. And, and it's really weird. When it comes, we have a lot of used car dealerships in that territory. <laughs> and we've actually done some work in looking into how many used car dealerships would be knocked out of business. Of course, the immediate neighbors are like, that'd be great. Get rid of all the ugly used car dealerships. I'm like, yeah, but what's Prince William County going to do with 600 used cars? Because that's what we end up with um, at that point. Um, and, but more importantly, those businesses are, um, are you know, the, yeah, the used car dealerships aren't the prettiest thing in the world. The tattoo parlors and the cell phone accessory stores definitely aren't. But those tattoo parlors and, and cell phone accessory stores and used car dealerships in some cases are paying to put someone's kid through college. Yeah. And they're putting, paying for someone's daughter's dance lessons. And we are, we try very hard not to adversely impact businesses. Of course you have to balance that out with sometimes you go the other direction and now you're impacting residential homes instead. You, we try not to do that. So um, on a congestion relief project, <coughs> often the economic impact sort of comes in a second or third phase. If it's an economic development project like University Boulevard, well, it's all about how does it affect the businesses, how does it help the business grow. In some cases, these projects, we've seen this on Route 1. In some areas, the Route 1 projects have kind of blown up the neighborhood. If you go down to Triangle near Quantico, those businesses are gone. And there's not, now, some of them, like, did anyone know what the, anyone, if you grew up here, if you're old school, you know what the pink house, you know what the pink house is? We're kind of happy the pink house is gone, right? Um, the, um, but, um, the, um, but, there were probably businesses there that were thriving, and, it's, and, and some of them we were able to help move, but some of them kind of disappeared. Um, in North Woodbridge, what we've seen, though, is some of those shopping centers, especially in North, in North Woodbridge, as we make improvements there, mm -hmm. they're thriving all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, people can get there. Mm -hmm. Used to be no one, no one you know, going back to, you know, no one went there anymore because traffic was so bad, right? Um, those shopping centers are doing better, so it's a trade-off. So it's, it's a really fair question. We think that's what's going to happen on Route 28. We think if we build this bypass on Route 28, the businesses along Route 28 will actually do better because suddenly you'll be able to make a left turn to them during rush hour. What we've heard a lot from the restaurants is um, no one eats the restaurant except before five and after seven because it's too hard to get in and out um, during rush hour. If you take the traffic off, the, but make, adding a sixth lane doesn't solve that problem. It makes it even harder to turn left. Adding a bypass, however, gets the traffic away and those businesses will do better. That's a great question. Chris, you have You uh, zip through it kind of fast, but uh, First thing that you were you had up there was the uh, Godwin Godwin Drive extension, and uh, I mean I've been here for about 40 years, and I think they've been talking about it most of that time. Um, initially, they were talking about uh, extending it to 66. Yes. But your your thing has it going to uh, to 28. Yes. Yeah. So this is a great, that's so a great question. How can you put more load on 28? That's a great question. So I'm talking about the Prince William projects. So 
share a couple of details that Christopher touched on. So this section of road here, so again, coming up Godwin Drive, you get suddenly and you come to a dead end. But if you, if you look right in front of you, you can see where there's road right of way. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't take a lot of understanding of traffic engineering to know that road is not developed because it's developed on both sides. It's left open so that we can develop it as a road. That section of right of way, this piece right here, is part, and actually up to this spot here, if you can see a little light spot, is the alignment that used to be called the Tri-County Parkway. Mm -hmm. This is a road that would have run from Sudley, Sudley Road, would have crossed the river into Fairfax County, gone through a portion of Bull Run Regional Park, up to, up, up to 66, and then actually beyond 66 to Route 50, just west of Dulles Airport. Would have been a fantastic way to get people from Manassas and Mid-County Prince William and even Western Prince William up to Dallas Airport and take them off of 28. Um, back, oh gosh, 13 years ago, VDOT did a study of that alternative and several other roads to see what's the best way to get people from Prince William County up to the Dallas Airport area. And what was determined from that study was that the Tri-County Parkway, the road you were talking about that goes up to 66 and beyond, probably can't be built because within that area of Bull Run Regional Park, first of all, the, the, um, there were a lot of folks who were just opposed to taking any of the parkland at all for the road. And that was, already, that was only a political problem. But then it determined there were some wetlands in that area, and the cost to mitigate the filling in of those wetlands was going to make the project prohibitive, and it wasn't even clear that the Corps of Engineers was going to approve it. A little side note, not relative to this project, was what they decided instead was to extend Route 234 north of 66, take it into Loudoun County. They continued to call it the Tri-County Parkway for a number of years, even though at that point it only went through two counties. And then Rick Hanazales from Prince William County Transportation and I decided one day, from now on, we're going to call it the Bi-County Parkway. And if you don't know what the Bi-County Parkway is, you haven't opened a newspaper in this county in five years. <laughs> and I don't want to get that. But that road has been very controversial and has not moved forward. Um, and um, I try to avoid talking about it in large groups of people. Um, but, uh, but so what we've done here, the point is, we've used the print, most of the Prince William section of Godwin Drive. We still have the right of way, but if the road that the right of way was designed to um, serve never get built, we'll come use it for something else. What would happen is come back behind the Loch Lomond neighborhood, and then run parallel to the river, and then ideally you would connect to Old Centerville Road which we would then widen the bridge there and widen Old Centerville Road up to Ord, actually to just, just south of Ordway Drive, where it connects to 28. I'll come back to the second part of your question. If we can't get permission to do that, then we'll actually bring it, continue it through Princeton County, bring it down to this section of Yorkshire. This is less than ideal because there's a trailer park in here and it's just difficult. You're displacing a lot of people when you, when you condemn a trailer park. Um, and we'd connect to 28 and then we'd widen the bridge here. All of that only works because the MVTA, it didn't put on these slides, the MVTA is also in the process of funding the widening of Route 28 in Fairfax County. In Fairfax County, there's no question about how to do it. They don't have any place they can build a bypass, but more importantly, they have plenty of right of way. Once you cross over the Bull Run, you see that there's undeveloped land on both sides, and that's because in the 1980s, um, the Fairfax Board of Supervisors had the foresight to say, if this land's gonna develop, we need to reserve the right of way for an eventual widening. During that same era, the Prince William Board of Supervisors was busy approving commercial rezonings in Yorkshire that allowed the commercial development to come right up to the edge of the road, which was done, and I gotta say, I've talked to some people who were around in those times, they really didn't believe we would ever want to ride Route 28. They couldn't imagine why we possibly ever want to do that, so they didn't see it as a problem. Now, well, parenthetically, the fact that a couple of members of the Board of Supervisors owned some pretty valuable <laughs> land in Yorkshire at the time, or had relatives that did so, probably had nothing to do with the decision to let it all develop to maximum possible density. Um, but, um, but the point is that option was really close to us, unless we're willing to blow up all those businesses along the road. But this section here, starting at Bull Run, going all the way up to 66, or well, up to 29, will be widened to, to six lanes, and in some cases, as many, in some sections, as many as eight lanes. The design for that project is underway now. So that project is about two or three years ahead of our Prince William project and is being designed with the Prince William project in mind. Um, and then that last piece from 29 to 66, some of it's already wide, more importantly, Express Mobility Partners is redoing that entire interchange at 66. That project is essentially underway now. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's bulldozers on site and there's, there's cones everywhere. Um, and that's really important because there's no point in doing anything in Prince William until you add more capacity in Fairfax. There's no point in doing anything in Fairfax until you increase capacity at the 6628 interchange. But that sort of domino, the first domino has already been pushed on that. 
Ours is the third domino, and um, and so hopefully these things will roll out in a timely fashion, and over the next seven years or so, that's longer than we wish, but it's reality, we'll go from having the most congested corridor to a corridor that becomes dramatically less congested and doesn't get congested again until about 2050. And at that point, I will definitely be off the board. <laughs> um, so that's a good, that's a good question, because it's, it's complicated. It gets complex. So. And they're a long time, too. It, this has been a problem for a long time. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, come on. You can't make this easy. You went earlier, one of the projects that wasn't one you'd hoped to was yes. Wellington. Uh, was it Wellington? In the bypass? Is it on this list? Yes. We, yeah. Um, so we did not request widening, widening money for Wellington. No, I'm sorry. Construct kind of change 234 Southern Main. Oh, okay. So that's a great question. So another, there's, so there's, five, there's <laughs> five interchanges at along 234 north of Lake Jackson. There is the there's the two signals at Brentsville Road slash Brentsville Parkway, and then the second signal at Business 234. That one's funded. The next project up is uh, Clover Hill Road. That one's funded for design only. It's a long-term project. Uh, the next one after that is University Boulevard. That project's fully funded. The northernmost one is Ballsford Road. We touched on that. Express Mobility Partners is funding that project. The one, the sort of the, the missing piece of this is the lights at Wellington and at Sudley Manor, which have to be treated like a single project. We have a design for that um, that, that uh, VDOT paid for a, you know, a sketch design. You saw these designs are pretty rudimentary. VDOT funded that sketch design. Um, the project, the initial engineering estimate came in at hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, it just came in, it's a much bigger, bigger project than we ever anticipated. It's difficult to justify that kind of cost for an interchange. So, um, we are going to go back and um, sort of revisit that and come see if there's a better way to, to get rid of it. That's actually the most congested piece, mm -hmm. but it's, there's nothing you can do about it if you can't get all the money to fix it. Because what's really important, you can't start building the project until you know where all the money's coming from. Um, so we're going to redesign that. Um, what I will also say, though, is this. I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not troubled by the fact that it didn't get funded, we couldn't, tr it would, the process of trying to rebuild all five interchanges in the same five year window would make things so much worse for over that five years. You sort of have to take these things in steps. So, Ballsford Road is under design now, um, Brentsville Road and, and, um, and uh, University will start design next year. <coughs> It'll sort of be the second phase. Clover Hill will come into the third phase, and probably at that point, by the time we get to design on Clover Hill, we'll probably have a better plan for Southern Manor as well. Southern Manor and Wellington. Um, but, um, but if you know, I mean, if you know all these interchanges, there's a lot of undeveloped land that is planned for commercial and industrial use, office, retail, uh, data centers, whatever, whatever it is you might need in that area. All that's planned, but there's a lot of those landowners are sort of sitting waiting to figure out what's going to happen with the road so they know what they have to sell. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing. So. I'm Tom Hitt from the uh, Freedom Museum over okay. at the airport. Can we talk about the Clover Hill interchange real quick? Can you put that slide up? Sure. Yeah. Maybe you've heard about it from the airport folks, but this is the first I've heard of it. Yeah. So if you're going north on 234, yep. if you go left, to get to the airport, you would actually turn right. Yeah, we should actually just turn right, right on, 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 turn right on Clover Hill. Turn, make a U-turn at the traffic yeah. circle. You come back to the light. Which is a overpass now? Or? No. Oh, that, that looks no. Like there would still be a light. The difference is that that there would be no left turns. So the the period of time that the um, the 234 has a red light would be 15 seconds every three minutes rather than one minute every three minutes in heavy traffic. Now, I understand the cost and all that, but what if that was an overpass on 234? What, so oh, would feed underneath. that would be better. And then you wouldn't even have to stop. That would be better, but it would be 10 times more expensive. And the problem is, this intersection is the one that creates the least congestion on the corridor. So it's, anything you do to drive the price up makes it. But whatever you have to go to the airport, you know, always don't. Yeah. Stop being it, It's absolutely plausible. It's absolutely plausible that um, by the time I mean, we're not going to plan to start the design. We're, we're asking for design funds, and the design money won't even be available to us for four more years. Okay. So it's very plausible between now and then this will be completely redesigned. So, but it's, it's a fair question. Yes, Thank you. Sir.
I'm not understanding. Well, I mean, being that I know that intersection quite well. Yeah. Um, so when you're coming, um, let's say we're going south on 234. Yep. Okay. And you want to turn into your old neighborhood. Right. You're going to turn right toward the airport, make a U-turn, come back to the light, I'm going to sit a minute, and then go through, and then go through the traffic service. So you just made it. I just, I, I can't envision that happening because as it is now, if you're setting up that light, people are coming down that hill at least 60 miles an hour. Well, they shouldn't be doing that. The speed limit's 35. <laughs> <laughs> and on behalf of Chief Bernard, I am deeply troubled. <laughs> that intersection, people, because it is a downward slant, people are coming down that, I mean, cars, trucks, big trucks, are coming down at a great speed. Yeah. And I can't see them getting to that intersection and then going, mm -hmm. Well, they're going to, and, 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 and so let me, let me, let me say for a third time, I'm not real happy with this design. Good. Okay? <laughs> Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I'm not, like what I said before, I'm not real happy with this design. That said, part of, part, part, one of the things this does is it forces everyone, including those trucks, to slow the heck down because they're about to hit a traffic circle. I can see another place from any How do they get out of that development on so, the... So, let me, let me, I'm going to say, for I, that's a great question. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about a project that I don't like that won't be designed for five years. <laughs> so, let's, so let's agree. Who here loves this design? <laughs> You're hired. Uh, this, this is going to raise a lot of concerns. This is a project that's going to be designed in five years. Very bluntly, here's the part I care about. We got $2 million to, fix this, to start figuring out how to fix this problem. This is a preliminary design. To be clear, you will not be able to make left turns at this intersection. That's, that's under this design. The design might change. But I am not in a position to answer questions beyond this is a design that VDOT came up with that they think solves our traffic problems here. There's a lot more work to determine if it needs to be or not. I don't, I don't want to cut anybody off. I just don't want to get too hung up on something that's way in the future. It's two elections away. Um, Chris. <laughs> what are the plans for expanding Wellington from Godwin all the way down to the bypass? Well, you know, you're going to pass by Freedom Center, the police department, Quarry, all of that. You say, on Wellington? What was the third noun you used? Police department? Quarry. Quarry with a Q. Yes. I thought she said Quarry. <laughs> 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 I don't know what that means. Vulcan Quarry. Vulcan, yeah. Vulcan Quarry. No, I got you. No, I know. Um, so, uh, Wellington is in our conference of plan to be four lanes. It hasn't been a priority project because, bluntly, right now, the road itself isn't that congested. Right? I mean, there's traffic on it, but there are other corridor, east or west corridors, like for example, Balsford Road, which are carrying a lot more traffic and are anticipated to carry a lot more traffic. So Wellington would sort of be a second tier sort of priority for us. Um, and um, I what I'll suggest is that, I think what you're gonna see is once we're able to widen Balsford Road, the, the quarry traffic will always, will always be on Wellington, of course, <clears throat> but a lot of the industrial traffic that sort of cuts between you know, city between Godwin and, uh, and 234 Bypass. So largely, a lot of that will be migrated to Ballsford Road, I think, that's what's gonna happen. There'll still be some traffic on it, but again, we're just, we're just not getting those, those low grades at the intersections on Wellington that we're getting at the others. But it is in our plan to wait, make it four lanes. It's just not what we're looking for money for right now. That's a good question. You're right. So I'm asking this question as a member of the press and as a member of the chamber. Um, so. 28 uh, Godwin extended. Yeah. Um, I see where you're adding capacity, mm -hmm. right, to Route 28 yeah. by building the bypass. But I, I don't see where you are relieving congestion. So it's a two-part question. Yeah. How do you abate the fears of those who live in the city of Manassas and those who live in the county near the fairgrounds area that that 28 extended will draw people from the Linton Hall corridor as traffic flows like water, yep. instead of them taking 234 bypass to 66, 
Instead, they will take that new 28 extended. So how do you abate the fears of those who live in Manassas and the county around the fairgrounds? And secondly, what's the thought process on this? Uh, will people take 234 business up past the hospital and then get on the bypass? Or will people get off 234 at, uh, at, at the uh, interchange and take Godwin to so. It's a great question. Process so you and you actually answered part of it in the question. That is, the traffic flows like water. It takes the easiest path. Okay, a, a large percentage. I don't have the numbers. They're, they're, I have this. I have this book about this thick. That if you ever, if you ever have, if you have insomnia, have trouble sleeping, ask me. You can find it on the web. A copy of the Route 28 Congestion Relief Alternative Study. It will knock you right out in three minutes. So let me get to the end of it. Um, but the um, the route the, the the first phase of the of the feasibility study basically. Um, what it shows is that a significant percentage of the traffic um, that's on 28 through Yorkshire right now are travelers who are, or the trips that originate west of the city or within the city of Manassas. Okay. So if you're along Linton Hall Road, the ability to not have to go through Old Town, but if, if you're determined to be on 28, if you're determined to be on 28, not having to go through Old Town Manassas is a boom. Right, because you can get a Godwin drive and go up and around, and there's a pretty big number of those people. Now, by the way, we're hoping that some of those people will fill the 25% increase in seats that we have with the Manassas line of VRE. EMP is banking a lot on the assumption that some of those people are going to take advantage of the new express bus service that's being added I-66, the new commuter um, carpool uh, lots that are being built on 66, and the ability to ride HOV3 on 66 and we'll actually won't be on 28 at all. So there's gonna be some <coughs> reduction in traffic along that corridor in the shorter term because of VRE and um, 66. When we design projects like this though, we don't, look at, we don't actually look at what traffic is like today. What traffic is like today informs us that we have a problem. When we design the project, we look at what traffic is expected to be in the future. And right now that's built around the Council of Government's 2045 model. So what we're looking at is what do we think traffic will be like in 2045 if nothing else is done? So in addition to the fact that there's a pretty sizable amount of traffic either you know, looping, going, getting through the city of Manassas one way or the other, whether it's all through Old Town or not, maybe it's up suddenly to get to 28 and clogging up traffic, there is almost all of the expected additional traffic in the future along that corridor comes from west of Manassas. Um, there is some undeveloped land south and east of the city of Manassas. Uh, you know, folks along the Prince William Parkway, but in terms, but most of most of the land along the Prince William Parkway corridor, for example, is planned semi-rural. So we're looking at um, you know, we're looking at single-family homes, and once that land gets developed, sometime over the next you know five to fifty years, we sort of estimate well that's how much traffic is going to come. There's not going to be a lot of additional traffic coming out of Lake Ridge up um, Prince or West Ridge coming up Prince William Parkway to Route 28. Where we're expecting new growth is west of the city of Manassas. So that's what drives this analysis. So but is uh, there a fear that, that some people will instead take the 28 extended where today, instead of what they do today, and take 234 north to 66 where you're building a DBI at Baltimore Road? Um, some of that will happen. There's no question. But remember, 66 will be much more, much easier to travel at that point as well. To the extent that people, I mean, today, in fact, I'll say it this way, if I live west of the city of Manassas, I live, I live in Mid-County, I live south, pretty far south of the city of Manassas, if I lived immediately west of the city of Manassas, and you show me this, I would immediately say, great, this gets me off of 66, and, and lets me go around Yorkshire and into Fairfax County, okay? However, by the time that that becomes a reality, the improvements to 66 will already be done, so there will be, 60, getting on 66 will no longer provide an incentive to find an alternative to 66, because 66 will be better. Um, I mean, all of these things all sort of only work in the context of, like, if we, if we were just improving 66, or just building a bypass, slash, or widening 28, or just improving VRE, um, traffic really wouldn't get better. So the population would grow faster than the infrastructure is increasing. But when you think about how over the long term, population's gonna increase, traffic's gonna increase, but when you take all three of those major improvements, plus all these other smaller projects we're doing together, um, 
it gives people more options. And I think that's the key thing. This is, this is the hard thing. It's a little hard to talk about in charts. What we find more and more is that um, when people, and this is interesting because this is organically starting to happen, people no longer talk to us about this is the project I want. I mean, it's, I mean, they, look, everyone wants, the, everyone wants their own residential street repaved and they want the traffic signal retimed at the end of their neighborhood. <laughs> but once they get out of their neighborhood, things become less parochial once you get out of your own neighborhood. And people stop saying what we need is more VRE or what we need is a wider road or what we need is a bypass. And what I started to hear more of is what I want is to know that VRE is more reliable for those days when my carpool doesn't work out. And suddenly the conversation gets framed into people are aware that there are options available. They want those options to be either better or more reliable so that they can carpool one day, take the bus the next day, ride VRE the third day. Okay, no one really does that in the same week, but at least they have the, they have the ability to change modes or change routes depending on what's going on in their life or what's going on around. Um, but you're right, no, there's no question that the bypass may divert some traffic off of 66, but presumably that's balanced out with express lanes on 66, diverting people out of their cars into buses, into those express bus services. So that's a good question. Patrick. The 28 out of Manassas from Liberia up, assumedly, will become more passable for those people who live at the fairgrounds now, and they can continue to take 28 the way they always have. Yeah, oh yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. I mean, the reality is if you live near the fairgrounds, it would probably still be better to go through Manassas, right? If you, live, if you live on that section of old 234, that probably will still be your better route. If, if 66 isn't the better route. I mean, maybe 66 will be the better route for those people. Um, the other thing I think is important to understand is one of the things our study showed was that just the improvements that are being made in Fairfax County will actually have a huge impact on Prince William County. I have a lot of, I've had people get quite cross with me, actually, people who live in Yorkshire or in the Single Hill area especially, because those folks are always going to be 28. They're never going to take this bypass. And what they say to me all the time is, well, why can't you speed this up? Why can't you get our project done before Fairfax's project? The answer is, well, because we can't. It's just, these things take time. But also because we don't really need it to be done right away um, in the context of, again, we're looking toward 2045. The, the logic that says that 28 needs to be fixed today, regardless of what's going on in Fairfax, only works because what was happening was that people were sitting in heavy traffic as they go through Yorkshire. And as soon as they get across the bridge, they start free flowing. But the number one question I get asked about this is, well, are you going to widen the bridge? And then just, yes, we're going to widen the bridge. But widening the bridge today, if I could suddenly wave a magic supervisor wand and have a wider bridge today, traffic would be no better. Because the problem isn't the Bull Run Bridge. The problem is the intersection of New Braddock Road. That's where the problem is. If you could wave a magic supervisor wand and put a great separate interchange at New Braddock Road, we would cut 30 to 40 minutes off of everyone's commute every day. But <laughs> but it's going to take six years and, you know, a lot of money because um, these things take time. But that's the catch is that it's, it goes back to that domino effect that you've got to start. And, and, and by the way, the real, real problem is not New Braddock Road. The real, real problem is the 6628 interchange. Mm -hmm. But again, Express Mobility Partners, you guys get a lot of free plugs. Mm -hmm. I, I need, I need to, Express Mobility Partners is fixing that problem as we speak, getting rid of those lights, adding a lot more capacity, eventually tying it in. Because when are the lights going to be gone? Uh, lights will go in 2020, two years. So two, within two years, those, those two horrible, horrible lights that are kind of right on top of the 6620 interchange will be gone. That'll speed things up. Within two years after that, that, um, that interchange will be feeding into seven lane or five lanes in each direction rather than three lanes in each direction. And, um, and that'll be the first reliever. New Braddock Road will be right behind that. Then the Prince William County Project will be behind that. 